what really interests me about looking at that website is I want to see where Google and YouTube fit in. I think that will be very revealing because uh, we may have an institution that's more populist oriented, in which case the radicalness of the populist, uh, you know, bent on it may be very timely. And it may yes, be. Yes, I think you're right. I think you're, you know, where I think the most important thing going now is the Paul and Gloria stream going on the internet talking about it. And I remind you, my dear, that we've now run out of time. Tell me, what is your background? Um, out of Michigan, uh, interested in things, did all the work for the doctors in geography, got very interested in things comprehensively, wanting to think about big patterns rather than specialization. And um, uh, he, and so I became interested in everything and then got attracted to Buckminster Fuller as a comprehensive philosopher. Marshall McLuhan, Tahar Deschardins, people thinking about the evolution of events on a large tableau. And then got interested in communication through association a little bit with Marshall McLuhan, who was the, touted as the oracle of the electronic age. He was really an interesting person. And there was a lot blowing in the wind and stirring about 1970 or so. So I got interested in that because I was interested in the communication as soon as a port pack what they call a port pack which was the first device by which an individual, rather than an institution, was able to make television. And that in turn developed uh, from the work of uh, Peter Goldmark Sr., who had invented videotape. Well, are you oh, talking? We did the inventiveness of our technological uh, entrepreneurs and developers and so forth. When are you talking? The forty, the forties, or the fifties? I, I don't think it would have been. I think it would have been because the early television they didn't have videotape. You realize they had what they called kinescope. It was a filming process, and they just didn't have a way to store the uh, images and so forth, and he invented that. He and his secretary, Bonnie, I remember doing a program with them way back with a grad man. And then his son became very, he became the chairman of our Port Authority here in New York City, Peter Gomart Jr. But Peter Go anyway, he invented it, and so all the work was coming from Japan, and I got the use of about the fourth port pack that came off the boat from Japan back around 1970. I think the first one went to the president, and the second one went to a couple, uh, Nam June Pike, an artist. But I had a friend who had one of those, and it was a reel-to-reel -reel thing, and you could make 20 minutes of television. An individual could make television rather than it being some big institution you had to be associated with, like those early machines. And so that's how I got started in television. And so this uh, is public access and then there was sociologically and politically this movement uh, to make available to the people and democratize the access to communication and so the program that I do here is the longest running still running program in public access I guess in the country well, that's I've been a... interested in it all along and along comes Paul and Gloria pushing the envelope and giving us direction and everything like that and so this public access is important, and I guess I'm democratically inclined, and I take my hat off to her saying she would include all 10 billion people into the dialogue. Let's all get together in one big ballroom and make an apple pie. Well, in a certain way, we're doing it on the Internet. Say, Harold, on the posting with Robert Ashford, who's going to be speaking yeah. to several thousand attorneys in two days, yeah, he's coming here to our house tonight. He's going to stay with us tonight. He's on the airplane and, on his and way to New York tell, now. Tell me again the nature of the conference and who will be there, because it's not well, open. I'm not, you know, I'm it, not really sure, but it is a conference of law professors. And okay. I remember those people are quite well known because they're academics and, uh, you know, in the legal profession. Right. And some of them it's are not, well known. I don't really know who the live, you know, the big stars of that it's, world are. But it's not open to the public, right? No, no, it's to the people who make up this association. And they're going to, he told me they're going to have something like 5,000 lawyers. Okay. Gathering at, okay. boy, that, that's something to contemplate, you know. Right, I mean? no, I'm looking forward to that. Now, I want to just say that on the posting and on your site with, with Robert Ashford, 
Somebody named Robert Cyril said, an excellent intro to binary economics. However, my project goes beyond this subject and is called Transfinancial Economics, or TFE. And then I ask him if he's going to be at the conference, then he says, no, thank you for your comment. I will not be at any conference. TFE is at this time of writing a work in progress. I also know Rodney Shakespeare who is a major yeah. authority on binary economics, or BE. Robert Where Ashford co-authored a very... Where is he located? What's that? Where is he located? Well, Robert Cyril, I was going to ask you, do you know him? No, I don't. But well, you see, you should spend some time on your YouTube because it's on your site that I got it. His name is Cyril 8. I'll send it to you on email. But this is, hey, the, this is the kind of thing that I feel is that autodidactic, self-teaching nature of the Internet. Yeah, it's wonderful. I think it's like a great big university. So you don't even know Robert Cyril? No, I don't know the name, um, but that doesn't mean... I, 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 I don't recall, anyway. Well, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited about what's going to be happening with these 5,000 attorneys. Well, they're going to be talking... They're going to be talking about a lot of things legal and so forth, and there's one section that Bob's been able to get, he calls it socio-economics, trying to broaden the scope of legal minds in terms of economics, and uh, then there's a few people within that that have some interest in this binary notion that Bob, as far as I know, is the only professor in all of North America that teaches this notion of economic theory that in my mind is destined to um, uh, inform the entire political and sociological organization of the planet. Now, so now, I think it's an important thing that is overlooked because it's so very inconvenient to our historically inherited notions of things. And I, the, the thing with Mark Stallman, he had a great deal to say about Joseph Schumpeter, right. an you know, creative entrepreneurialism who was arguing it out in the 30s, 40s, and 50s with with Cain, who came to reign and that kind of thing. Right. Anyway, well, they're well, going to have this big conference, and we're going to help Bob get some footage and everything, and he'll be here, and then um, it's going to be a real busy week because we got some things we have. Harold, can you correct me on something if I'm wrong? Uh, Robert Ashford is carrying the torch for Louis Kelso, who was an attorney in San Francisco and developed binary economics in the 1950s. Well, he started in the 50s along with Mortimer Adler. Okay, and Mortimer Adler had the Encyclopedia Britannica? Well, he was chairman. Chairman. And a lot of, and he was a major philosopher. A lot of okay. people, there are a number of people who would see him perhaps as one of the leading contemporary philosophers. Now, now did, did Lewis Kelso develop um, the leveraged buyout? He did the first ever leveraged buyout, yeah where they use the assets of the corporation to buy it as collateral uh, for and to buy it as, for in, in a pattern where the ownership became to be vested in the employees of the corporation rather than in a stock owning. Okay, pattern. so this is what I want to ask. My father had something when you were working at McHale's where you had a stock ownership participation. Do you oh, remember that? Oh, that's a long time ago. It's I was not working there. I was, uh, when I was going to school, I was working part-time, you know, as a... Employee. Washing... Windows. Washing the windows in the cars. Uh, there was nothing. I don't even... Yeah, but what my mom said, because she knew Louis Kelso, was that this... Oh, really? Yeah, no, she knew his work in the, in the employee stock ownership program, and she said that my dad had just... I do think there is a, a value in looking for certain institutional opportunities that allow to speak allow us to speak to, to more economically to many people. For, for just just as an example, in New York City, you're from New York City. There 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 is, I'm sure, an interreligious council of faiths dedicated to helping poor and working. Why, why hasn't that organization heard about this idea? I, I, I mean, that's, this is an example. And, and, and it, it's, it, to me, it's a mystery. Uh, but it's there. And I do think that if that interreligious council were to listen
commitment to this idea and spend three or four or five hours thinking of it. And let's say there are 30 people on that council. My, I'm convinced that 10 or 15 of them would get it. Right. And they would be able to speak to people, and that would, that would both trickle down and trickle up. I, I'm glad you bring that up because I have a man in mind, Frank Morales at the St. Mark's Church. I'm very impressed with, uh, with the decisions that he's made and I've always been maybe overly anxious to have a seminar about Jesus in India. But um, I think he might be just the man for the job because there's also another man in the 9-11 Truth Movement that I'm impressed with. His name is Kevin Barrett. And uh, he teaches Arabic, uh, you know, he's a Westerner who became a Muslim, but very, he, he has that quality of the Koran, and he talks about conviviality, and that's something if you ever, I read the, the Koran in a Tibetan refugee camp in India, because I spent four years there covering the bases, and the Koran has this quality of beauty and harmony to it, and this is what attracts me to binary economics. It's harmonious to have everybody in society connected. Yes, it is. And, and there are, there are that. There is, by the way, on, on the web, um, uh, an article that I wrote on Christianity. It's, it's called Using Christian Principles to Enhance Economic Theory. And I argue that in that, in that article that, it, that if you take Christianity to, to be simply the words of Jesus, so we just we have a limited definition. It's not the Father's teaching. It's not all the things in the New Testament. It's not the epistles. It's just the red. You know, sometimes Bibles have the red words. The red. If you make yourself a red word Christian and read the words of of Jesus, what he says, what he stands for, um, and you look at them, you look at right wing economic theory, you look at left wing economic theory, you look at, look at mixed economic theory of the left and the right. Look at the Keynesians. You look at all that, and you look at binary economics. Binary economics is clearly the most consistent theory, according to uh, Jesus. Uh, and I can, I, we could expound on that. But, uh, but just as an example, Jesus says the, the, the sun shines and the rain falls on the good and bad alike. That that when you include, when he broke the bread and included everybody, there was more, not less. The whole principle about the idea that all good comes from God. And that we are responsible for the rest. Capital ownership is the opposite. Is what is, that's the laws of nature. Capital ownership follows God's laws. It's human free will that gets things screwed up. And the human free will can result in good only when it's consistent with God's uh, approach. And so but, loving inclusion is the principle of binary economics. Exclusion is the principle of, of, of plutocratic trickle down capitalism, and also. Uh, the other element is that private property is what liberates people. Right. Uh, and so, th so again, that's, that's a part of what it is to be a human being. You're getting into some of my very favorite topics, but uh, I don't want to launch in on that uh, right now. Um, but I do want to say that I think we should move forward with, with this feeling of... Um, looking at all the resources and I'd like to see you have a greater presence on the internet and at the same time I'm going to make some efforts to start looking into what exactly is going on with the ownership of the internet and I feel fortified by this wonderful opportunity to to have a, a cable daily show in Manhattan because the people are very savvy there you know to get some feedback and also, um, Harold Channer and I are not so much linear people. So I, I think the Bible has a value, but I like to know not what Jesus said, but I want to see some demonstration in the here and now. And I have tried to explain to Harold that I feel that scarcity has always been transcended, not only with the multiplying of the loaves, but that if Jesus came as a, as a man and had to go through everything that human beings go through, he would certainly have to exert himself in a course of studies. And I find that there's a huge body of knowledge in India, uh, and I'm sure all over the world, but that's one where it's very uh, prevalent, that you have books like the Vedas, but there's another dimension that goes in a non-linear way, and that's what I'm very excited to explore in the future, to see if we can bring people together on all levels, on the Internet, also physically, 
So I'm going to go to Frank Morales and see if perhaps binary economics might be what I was seeking for in, in, uh, in this idea of Jesus having studied in India. Well, I'm all in favor of anything you do. You really have been, you've been very, 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 very good in terms of giving this publicity. And, and well, Thanks. well, it's it's the least I can do to give back because, like I say, because of a fluke of circumstances, I'm an example of capital distribution in this in this uh, cellular licensing, and it, and it's kind of like a blessing that I never realized I had. You know, I mean, obviously, the money, five million dollars, is great. And, and then I lost it in other things because people was, were saying to me, Paula, it doesn't always come that way. But I'm really glad that it came the way it did. And I'm, I'm so grateful for the people who are around me now, people like yourself, that we can have this kind of discussion. And, uh, and also with Harold and with Joe Friendly to see if we can maximize uh, what a Manhattan Neighborhood Network cable access channel going through the physical ground of Manhattan and then through the airwaves throughout the world. I think I think there is a mechanism to it and content is king. Oh and finally I want to say I'm not against willpower Robert. I think we need a lot of willpower right now to keep moving forward with this idea. Hey Harold, now that we're off, I, I just talked to you again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you, we, I got a lot of we're kind of uh, going like uh, crazy. You Did, were you yeah. ever recording? Yeah, because everything? he's far off on all. He's tying the whole thing together, and I'm just looking at the simple, very simple beginning. Can you hear that? Yes, I can hear. You sound a little distant. My uh, gra I feel I'm a grassroots person on this, what I've witnessed and what I vaguely recall about my husband actually participating in a company that was doing this. And um, so um, when we, um, we'll get more information about the grassroots feeling, but I think about those ads on the business news of this big egg being rolled around. Uh, there's so much uh, encouragement for people to think about their nest egg and uh, we either rely on social security completely but uh, well you know all that but um, if, if things we don't uh, well uh, there's a lot of uh, if people want facts about Nixon and all that they can get it but uh, we want to see a uh, human nature wanting to feel the security of having something behind them as in our obligation we don't want to have, uh, be just taken care of it would be wonderful if we had something where we earned it we put in it well the theory of social security of course we earned it from the beginning hopefully but um, Security trust fund yeah. by people who worked at a job and gained income by their labor participation and, and I production. Know people who um, who were before Social Security and uh, didn't get anything, but they did uh, and buy telephone stocks in those days, and that's what saved a lot of people on their own. They did their saving and scraping around, so but they they didn't uh, have a their very own company. That's why this would be quite personal, I believe. If, uh, yeah, I think you're probably right, and at a level that's very interesting and very pragmatic and, yeah. and everything. It, it happened. There are some people that are interested in that. Bob Ashford, for instance, who had called in earlier, and Paul has been in touch with, and so forth. Well, is very much geared toward the practical realities of what can be done, and Norman Curlin certainly is. Um, I happen not to be. That's the problem. I'm, I'm very um, looking at the whole picture, you know. Well, Con yes, I realize that, and I haven't been, but I've only, it's what I've seen, and I, I am a pragmatic person. If it, I keep checking, does this work, does this work? And then if I lose in the stock market, I buy something else, but I never put all my eggs in the same basket. That's my theory, and, and, um, and, and recognizing your own needs, people should do that if, uh, 
If Van Gogh can go off and paint, and he has the supplies from his brother who sent him the paints and the oils. I mean, he's up to the yeah, well, um, but look how <laughs> it is now. <laughs> he had faith in himself, whatever. He had to cut off his ear, you know, because he was so frustrated because well, he um, couldn't, he would like to have been successful, but it wasn't successful until it, was it good that $35 he just, million dollars in Sotheby. But look, at, <laughs> it could be that, uh, that such experience, as long as he had his brother supplying what he needed, he could keep painting. The, what if the, the system itself had supplied what he needed, uh, not only his needs, but also his reasonable wants and so forth in a systematic way that was growing? Well, let's think of the creativity. Of think of the creativity that would burst forth. This a gigantic renaissance of the human spirit that could yeah. come forth if we ever get the right system to give people that the, elemental security. The so they, uh, it'll end up where now most people do not think about anything a other than money, it seems. That's the only guide by which they judge things. And if we could get to a point where nobody's having to think about those things and are still living a reasonably good life because the collective capability is such that allows us to have that kind of a system, I think we would be in for a worldwide renaissance of the human spirit and create real creativity rather than uh, you know, manipulating stock values. And so well, forth. we make it, it's just been a lot harder. Mozart died young, too. They always needed a patron, a patron. So, uh, now, if we you don't start want writing that the... up, about 20 billion people uh -huh. on the planet by 2020, and uh, we've got all that thing going on in China, and, and they've got systems in place that do not... As far as Mr. Stiglitz, I don't know if you're familiar with him at Columbia, he's, I think he was Nobel Prize winner and also was uh, <laughs> chief economist of the World Bank and so forth. He says the system serves well, as it always has, maybe the, let's be generous and say the upper 20% of the world population is able to live fairly well in their gated communities and so forth, but for 60 to 80 percent of the world population are not well served by the system of uh, uh, the economic system, and you've got women in Africa wondering which of their two babies they're going to let starve to death because there's not enough food to eat, when we know we have the capability collectively of uh, providing for everybody in an unprecedentedly abundant way. Harold, well, that's what China tries to do, feed their people first now. Yeah, that's always the case. And um, and there are a number of people, I could maybe get some links through Paula or something to you, of people that are much more practical than myself, right? But Harold, I'm along... Not. I'm, I'm thinking Harold, about the whole... Harold, <laughs> along the lines of practical people, uh, you know, I talked to, uh, to, to Margaret about, you know, using the wonderful capital asset of your living room, not only for a Christmas party, but maybe we could uh, collect some of these thinkers together and, and put the word out that, that we do want to bring people from different, different perspectives. Yeah, well, that's a thought and everything, and it's something that is, you know, she... she uh, but uh, in both cases, both Margaret and I, this is like our home. I know. And if we're not particularly interested in just having one group of people after another coming through here like a public space. Right. We want to protect the fact that this is a private space. Well, I know, and but... that uh, we're, we're, we've got things we're doing. Well, right, right, I, my, right. My thought is, I, myself... Right uh, now, uh, right now, my mom is creeping off the out, bed. <laughs> reach out by Skype to some of the people around the world and so forth from I here. Love it. I love it. Tell you me. love what? The discussion is so stimulating, I have to... <laughs> My mother said the discussion is so stimulating <laughs> that... go off and <laughs> relax. She has to go off and relax well, now. We, we've been, we've been conducting... Like we've and been... we're under some pressure now, Glory. We had to, uh, Paul, we have to get the camera fixed. I know. And Joe just called, and then we've got things that are of a personal nature with the courts and so forth. Right. It's pressing. Okay, well, we're going to sign off now. Way, you know. 
we're going to sign off now. I just want to say we've conducted all of this on our, uh, in my brother's bedroom. <laughs> there you go. There you go. You see, and it can be done with what we have, and you can reach out to the world. Exactly. And we'll reach out to Bob, and we have to get him with a camcorder so he isn't uh, all upset about the idea of getting out. And it's going to be in the realm of public access. It's a keynote address, and there's a couple of sections on binary, and I'm wondering if maybe I have to, Joe just called uh, today. We talked to him, or maybe Mr. Goldberg might be interested in getting absolutely of, of copy uh, of doing some archiving. Absolutely, to Scott. Support Bob in his effort, because Bob's the only person in the United States of America that's teaching binary economics. Right. So, right. I, but most people won't see that. You say they won't. Harold, Harold, con contact Scott Goldberg because he loves the fact that we're putting positive, positive uh, solutions. Or, or possibilities on the table. Well, and you're going to have a hard time getting a lot of people who, who are concerned with public access, the so-called progressives, to be interested in something that's going to be talking about a, bo a book called The Capitalist Manifesto when they've been raised like mother's milk on the Communist Manifesto of Karl Marx. Well, you'd be surprised what what's going to be coming out of the 9-11, uh, reinvestigate 9-11 movement. Yeah, that's going to know. stir up a lot of, uh, of uh, systems-wide uh, angst uh, about the system and so forth. Right, and so that's, that's why that's why it's important. Computer. That's why it's important yeah. to have these uh, these positive uh, new paradigms on the table. Well, they're, they're paradigms that I believe in. At least the principles are important. And that's why I'm not actually interested in doing much of anything. I'm interested that we get the ideas right first. If we get the idea, then maybe there will be something to which people can repair to get a sense of how we're going to address the, con the what's confronting the human condition writ large. Right. And so that's my thinking. Well, that, that's, well why, that's why I'm looking for a physical space where people can meet, you know, because oh, they're, yeah, they're, yeah. Well, they're, I know. Was, they're meeting yeah. down at ground zero and they're protesting and they're yelling and, you know, but that's not the physical space I'm thinking about. I'm thinking of something You're thinking quiet. You're like a salon or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good idea. And I, Some, something, I, something to sort of physicalize uh, Rabbit Hole Central TV. I mean, I can, I, you know, when Webster was here, I packed forty people into my little apartment. <laughs> good for you. you. Know? That's really efficiency. That's you, an efficient were, use of space. You were there, Harold. Fuller, you I were know there. Mr. Fuller used to say the uh, geodesic structures. You know, right? The most efficient way to include space, doing more with less, and that's all there. I just, on my part, knowing Maggie, yeah, I have to guard against the idea that there's going to be a stream of people who want to set up an art show or a, you know, no, I know. like that. And it was so good. So then, do you, shall we try to do something again tomorrow? Let me, let me, I might be going over to my father's tomorrow and then I can get better internet access and maybe uh, get my dad to take a look at this Kelso stuff because...